everyone. Hi. Welcome to Auckland's first Raising the Bar event, brought to you by the University of Auckland. <laughs> um, we're really happy to have you here tonight for Professor Tracy McIntosh's talk, Imagining a World Without Prisons. Raising the Bar first started in New York City in 2014 and has been a huge international success. This is the first year Auckland is delivering this event. So tonight you're one of 2,000 people across Auckland and nine other bars listening to one of our top researchers from the university. I'd like to say a huge thank you to The Bird Cage, our venue for hosting us tonight. And don't forget to post on social media with the hashtag RTBAKL for your chance to win one of $500 Westfield vouchers. Yeah, <laughs> thrilling. <laughs> All right, I'd like to welcome to the stage Professor Tracy McIntosh. Kia ora koutou katoa, nga mihi nui ki a koutou. Ko na tātua te waka, ko tūhoi te iwi, ko Ngāti Koura te hapū, ko Otunuku te pā, ko Tracy McIntosh ahau. Kia ora koutou katoa. C. Wright Mills taught us that neither the life of the individual nor the history of the society can be understood without understanding both. The sociological imagination involves us developing a deep understanding that acknowledges that anyone's personal biography, their individual narrative, is the result of historical processes that occur within the larger social context. Mills believed in the power of the sociological imagination to connect personal troubles to public issues. Over the last nine years, I've gone into Auckland Regional Women's Correction Facility at Woody on a weekly basis and have delivered a creative writing program and also offered educational support. My research work focused particularly on Māori hyper-incarceration, global indigenous incarceration, and strategies to inform decarceration. Tonight, however, will not be a reciting of statistics to demonstrate that Māori are overrepresented in every step of the criminal justice system and that this increases at every step through that system. I take it as a given that the people that are, are aware of these statistics, because as I say, very often it is the most well-known social statistic in New Zealand that Māori make up over 50% of the prison population. I take it as a given that there is recognition of the devastation that the prison plays in the lives of whānau, of the community, and of the nation. Tonight, in our very short time together, I want us to think about our ability to create the conditions for positive change. We must envisage and work towards the end of prisons. We must have a gaze that goes beyond our immediate circumstances, that does not normalise uh, our present is some enduring blueprint for our future that is not tied to short three-year electoral cycles or succumbs to a social myopia and collective apathy that renders us incapable of recognising our ability to be agents of transformative change. We must go beyond merely describing our world and seek to change it. This necessitates a generational gaze that demands a better future, a just future, for those who will come. For me as a Māori, one of our greatest strengths comes to a commitment to Mokopunatanga, a recognition that our focus must be on the lives of our grandchildren and their grandchildren. We must work with conviction towards a flourishing future where the shadow of the prison no longer distorts and corrupts one's life chances or where the intergenerational reach is so long. Why is it so difficult, even preposterous, to imagine a world without prisons? Perhaps a more pressing question is why do we take prisons for granted? All societies have social regulations, all societies have forms of social control. But prisons, as the most dominant form of punishment, as the punishment, is relatively new. The warehousing of surplus humanity in prisons and the ongoing carceralization of Māori and others is a crisis that has resulted in a profound unfreedom for individuals, for whānau, and for communities. 
It has resulted in an increasing unjust society where the shadow of the prison colonizes our landscape and colonizes our futures. I use the word colonization advisedly, as it is so much of our national story. And I'm going to draw on a whole range of, of people, and I think already I've got to recognize, you know, that how much I'm formed by the work of Moana Jackson, how much I'm formed by the work of Kim Workman, how much I'm formed by the women who I work with who are experts of their own condition, and I recognize that. I'm going to draw on Angela Davis here. So across the work of Angela Davis, she reinforces the seeming paradox of the inevitability, permanence, and invisibility of prison as features of our social lives. In many ways, the invisibility of incarceration and the ability to forget prisons and those po populations that inhabit them is because of the degree of difficulty for us to envision, to imagine, a social order that does not rely on the threat of sequestering people in places designed to separate them from their communities and from their families. The pr prison is considered so natural that it is extremely hard to imagine a life without it. As Alit Curry argues, the prison has become a looming presence in our society to an extent unparalleled in our history or that of any other industrial democracy. He goes on to say, short of major wars, mass incarceration has been the most thoroughly implemented government social program of our times. In many ways, this is because the existence of prisons is seen solely through a crime and punishment schema. This seems to be a self-evident truth and a rational accounting of present practice. We assert that the massive increase in incarceration is linked to criminality, yet the evidence is troubling. We have seen crime statistics level and decline, and we have continued to see prison populations rise. Of course, many see the increase of prison populations as an evidence of a successful war on crime. As I've noted elsewhere, and some of you will have heard me talk about this, we need to be very clear. There is no correlation anywhere in the world between the imprisonment rate and the crime rate. The imprisonment rate is not a measure of crime. It is a measure of the consumption of punishment. New Zealand does not just have a tolerance for a high incarceration rate, it has an enthusiasm for it. In fact, that New, the fact that New Zealand has such a high incarceration rate within a global context and what this might tell us about our society is really addressed. Nor is the makeup of our prison population addressed except when it is to reinforce cultural and racial stereotypes. Some commenters, uh, commentators have argued that the expansion of the prison is a geographical solution to social economic problems. But even this does not sufficiently speak to the fundamental question on why do we take prisons for granted. It is as, it is as if the thought of the absence of prison completely suppresses and surpasses our personal and social imaginaries. It demonstrates the limits we place on ourselves, on our imaginations, and the constraints of the parameters we set ourselves. We cannot imagine a social life, a social landscape without them. And this relieves us of the responsibility of seriously engaging with the structural problems of our society, especially those produced by racism, poverty, and the violence of the systemic frustration of aspirations at the individual and at the collective level. So I propose a little thought exercise for us. If we think about ourselves in prison, how do we see ourselves? If we do imagine ourselves in a prison, it is much more likely that we see ourselves as a prisoner rather than a prison guard. This in itself is sociologically intriguing. In 1978, Arthur Luggath, in his article, The Mind of the Torturer, said that it may be to our collective credit that when the subject of torture arises, most of us immediately picture ourselves as victims of torture. We ask, how much pain could I take? What would be my breaking point? Who would I portray when the agony got unbearable? As for the torturers, 
We are content to pass over them with a, with, a, with a question for which we expect no answer. How can one human being do this to another? He goes on to argue that we come to regard torturers as people apart, defectives born, as if they were without a heart or without a brain. Frightening as it may be to imagine oneself as a torture victim, it is worse, indeed intolerable, to imagine oneself with a whip or electrode in one's hand. While not equating the prison guard with the torturer, even though historically they have often been the one and the same person, our imagination may also falter at the thought that we may represent the prison guard. So is it possible to imagine a life without prisons? Imagining a world without prison, imagining an Aotearoa New Zealand without prisons, is not the pursuit of the impossible. Linda Tuhawai Smith, in response to recognizing the burden of negative social indicators, said, rather than be paralyzed by the weight, we must seek the pursuit of the possible. We must seek the pursuit of the possible. We can pursue the possible. The prison is not part of our natural world, it is a part of our social world. It is socially constructed, and just as it has been made, it can be unmade. So to imagine is to draw on the creative, intellectual, emotional, cultural and spiritual energies to create a just society where social harm is diminished, where community safety is enhanced, where victims and perpetrators are not constantly reproduced. This is within our power. At the moment, the carceral logic we live with creates a cognitive restriction. It suppresses our ability to think beyond the prison or even think that there is a beyond, beyond the prison. It would be difficult to think of any major social transformation in the history of humanity that has not been looked upon as unrealistic, delusionally, delusional, or naively utopian by the large majority, even a few years before that, was, that once was unthinkable becomes a reality. The German abolitionist criminologist Sebastian Scheer notes that among those once unfathomable historical transformations, one might recall the abolition of slavery, the end of the British Empire, the end of the Cold War, and the embrace of marriage equality around the world. The notion of exploring an end of prisons is not new. Moreover, extensive research has shown the failure of prisons. In New Zealand, our current Prime Minister has called them a fiscal and moral failure. A recent Minister of Corrections in New Zealand lamented on screen that the fact we currently spend more on locking people up than we do on early childhood education is lamentable. In this last section, I'm going to draw very heavily on Allegra McLeod's work on prison abolition and grounded justice. It is not the only framework we could draw on, and it's much more a a stretch of the intellectual imagination rather than all of the forms collectively we could draw on in this, in this space. It is not the only framework that we could draw on, but it starts to stretch us, perhaps only tentatively, beyond the familiar. She notes that there is good reason to doubt the efficacy of incarceration and prison-backed policing as a means of managing the complex social problems that they are tasked with addressing. We need to be clear that our problem would not be addressed if we just closed the prisons tomorrow and did nothing more. I often start one of my classes with, we should close the prisons tomorrow. Always get a particular response, but actually thinking, well, what would it do? What actually would happen? We saw that with the, uh, in California, really what was the carceral state, that in the global uh, financial crisis, they were sending out, because they were, California was bankrupted, they were largely sending out hundreds and hundreds of people per day, getting them out of the prisons. The effect was very little. In fact, the effect was negligible. But if prison ab abolition is conceptualized solely as just opening of the prison doors, that is the imminent physical elimination of all structures of incarceration, rejection of abolition is perhaps warranted. But abolition must be understood instead as a project of decarceration in which we draw on radically different legal, social and institutional regulatory forms to replace criminal law enforcement. 
This means social regulation, societal empowerment. In the New Zealand context, it would mean the ceding of penal power and the resourcing of iwi and community. It does not mean alternatives that just replicate our current prison situation. I'll come to that in a moment. So these institutional alternatives include meaningful justice reinvestment to strengthen the social arm of communities and improve human welfare. It involves reconceptualizing justice and preventions in ways that independently strengthen valuable social projects that will simultaneously stand to reduce crime. This entails reinvesting criminal law administrative resources to other sectors and also reinvesting the concepts of our justice prevention with more expansive meaning. Currently, we spend in excess of $1 billion for custodial purposes alone. As I often say, $1 billion .2 this year, $1 billion .2 next year. This year, we're going to spend a little more than that, around about $2.5 billion, because we're building another prison. So you just think about that in terms of justice reinvestment. How would we spend the money? How can we imagine spending that money? What would we do to decrease social harm in our communities? So these are just a number of things that we can sort of think about, that we can think about it. So one is that justice reinvestment. Others is, is the decriminalisation of less serious infractions and very serious drug reform and moving resources to the therapeutic space. That one is an interesting one. The decriminalisation or the legalisation of drugs would have an immediate effect on our prison population and particularly the very young people who once they go through have their opportunities absolutely thwarted as they go through. So that's a very serious place. You know, we've got a good example there. We can look at Portugal. Portugal legalised all drugs in 2001, put a huge amount of money into the health sector. They've seen no increase in uh, youth drug routes and they have seen what we would expect in terms of the change. It's not easy, it's still messy and it's a huge capacity and capability building. That was the thing that they struggled with most. They shifted the resources but actually for the first four or five years didn't really have the capacity and capability in terms of that area. Uh, improved design of spaces and products to allow human flourishing, urban and rural development and greening projects. A lot of research that's been done in the United States looking at thousands of greening projects in uh, deprived communities and seeing the, that those, those communities that have large greening pro uh, things have seen a, a resulting decrease in everything from gun crime to interpersonal violence to a whole range of elements proliferating restorative forms of redress, create, creating both safe harbors for individuals at risk or fleeing violence, and creating alternative livelihoods for persons otherwise subject to criminal law enforcement. Again, a very important element. Efforts to confront the school, the school to prison pipeline must be immediate. What Chester Burroughs described when speaking of the criminal justice system as the sewer by eliminating zero tolerance policies in schools that turn children who misbehave in schools over to police or just exclude them in education and offer no other meaningful engagement. Again, some of you will have heard me talking about this, where, it's a, where the zero tolerance policy, particularly towards drugs and violence, is an excellent example of good policy that produces bad, indeed terrible, outcomes for our young people. And real disproportionate in terms of who it largely uh, wears the effects of that particular group. So this is very significant in New Zealand and particularly in rural areas where there is no alternative uh, schooling education. We are largely denying the rights of young people to have an education by such policies. So it is another significant measure to eliminate criminalisation. Changes along these lines stand to address forms of structural violence. It means addressing the legacies of racism and colonialism and the need for a radical honesty in discussing and responding to these devastating legacies. It means significant cultural change, including how we discuss social harm, crime and responses to social harm with children. It may mean a new language. And that's one of the things I've been stunned you know, in terms of my own mokopuna and how young, at four years old, they're talking about jail. They've got the sense of good and bad guys. Uh, you know, and how quickly that comes in. What stories do we tell our children? How do we get them to respond to things that are difficult in this world, to injustice in this world? How do we get them to respond? Rather, we have this good, bad. 
given how nuanced all our lives are, given the complexities of what we do, how good people can do bad things, and certainly the opposite, we really need to think about our language with our children. So that a four-year-old, a five-year-old, shouldn't already be unable to imagine a world without prisons. When uh, it means new forms of media engagement, again, around social harms. When abolition is conceptualized in these terms as a transformative goal of gradual decarceration and the substitution uh, of positive social regulations where penal regulations is recognized as morally, socially, and culturally unsustainable. Decarceration and abolition does not seek to replace incarceration with alternatives that are closely related to imprisonment, such as punitive policing, non-custodial criminal supervision, probation, civil institutionalization, and parole. Instead, it entails a rejection of the moral legitimacy of confining people to cells. It is not an effort to replicate the institutional transfer that occurred in the aftermath of the deinstitutionalization of mental institutions. Rather, it is critical that the framework requires positive forms of social integration, uh, collective security that is not organized around criminal law enforcement, confinement, criminal surveillance, punitive policing, or punishment. McLeod argues that it is an aspirational, ethical, institutional, and political framework that aims to fundamentally reconceptualize security and collective social life. Rather than simply a plan to tear down prison walls, as such, abolition seeks to ultimately render prisons obsolete. It seeks to end the use of punitive policing and imprisonment as the primary means of addressing what are essentially social, economic, and political problems. It aims to dramatically reduce reliance on incarceration and to build the social institutions and the conceptual frameworks that would render incarceration unnecessary. Abolition, then, is not a simple call for an immediate opening or tearing down of the walls, but it entails an array of alternative, non-penal regulatory frameworks and a commitment to human flourishing, a commitment to Māori order. It opens the space for a transformational politics involving different individual actors, groups, and communities to address the problems that haunt criminal law administrators and haunt us as a society. Rather than rely on the correctional experts and administrative criminologists and their increasingly fine-tuned plans to reinvent probation or parole supervision or to reduce crime or to render prisons more humane, this is about an ethic that creates a space within which community members may organize themselves to empower vulnerable individuals and to address crime prevention by other means. Preventative justice rather than punitive justice provides a conceptual gro ground for understanding security anew. Community well-being and security is more meaningfully furthered by social solidarity, flourishing neighbourhoods, dignified work, education, labour unions, empowerment of vulnerable peoples, community organisations and basic social infrastructure. On this account, what counts as a just response to criminalise conduct, conduct turns crucially on the sociological, historical and institutional settings in which punishment actually unfolds and has historically unfolded. That challenge then is to address the structural issues of limited opportunities, unemployment, marginalisation, poverty. Rethink how we conceptualise crime, punishment, justice and ultimately how we understand ourselves. For this to happen, it must be first an act of imagination, informed by research, informed by the experience of victors and perpetrators, and a recognition that too often these are not discrete or separate groups. It must be fueled for a desire for greater levels of safety and a reduction of social harm. It must be focused on ensuring lives for all mokopuna and for their mokopuna. To finish, I want to read two poems. One by Maya Angelou, the acclaimed black poet, writer, and civil rights activist. And the other, a response to her poem by a young woman who entered the prison as a very young, as a girl, and wished to share her words with you tonight. So first I'll read A Caged Bird by Maya Angelou. 
A free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current eds and dips his wings in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The cage bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the cage bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breeze and the trade winds soft through the sighing trees and the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn and he names the sky his own. But a cage bird stands on the grave of dreams, his sh shadow shouts on a nightmare scream. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied so he opens his throat to sing. The cage bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, and the cage bird sings of freedom. I just want to show you that for those of you in the front that can see just how that, this is written. It's going to be a bit more difficult for me to read, but you know, this, this is written under conditions of incarceration. Very, very young woman, still within the prison, who I first met nine years ago. Does the cage bird sing to be d admired, a squawk, and scream to be desired? Does she sing with such prosperity and simply to find some dignity? A time to be caged and a time to be numb, the beauty and songs that are unheard of by some. A cry out with joy or purely from pain, she walks up and up and she sings again. No doubt of how her voice will be heard to sing or to shout, she's still a caged bird. She'll sing with volume and days pass her by, but how will she know what's beyond the sky? Is it to be happy why a caged bird sings? or unaware of what life may bring? Or is it a greater power that locks the cage, someone with fury or someone with rage? Is there a smile hidden in her song? They all stare, and yet they see nothing wrong. Although many knew who hold the key, she was a part of the world that she could never see. The joys of the song of freedom and flying, all caged in sorrow and belonging, and dying. Soft warmth of the sun, born in mists of rain, sung herself to sleep to try and hide her pain. No one understood why she never gave up, though they poked and prodded, they slammed that cage suck. But truly while the world judged and stared, deemed that it seemed that no one even cared, Although she sat many years confined and shifted, the outset of society never knew she existed. Now I know why I sing and what pulled me through. I questioned the system, but they had no clue. Because deep in my heart, at least it had a beat. The wind blew hard, but I got back on my feet. I can sing through the pain and all that they dealt. I would rather be caged than to never have felt. Then the cage grew old till it fell apart. It gave me a journey, a journey of heart. Kia ora koutou. Kia ora. Right on time. <laughs> Kia ora. So I'm very, we've, we've got a very strict uh, timetable, and I just want to thank everyone for being here, uh, you know, for both of us coming, we really appreciate that. Is there any other questions, any comments? Um, kia ora. Mm. We still have prisons. Why can't we learn from overseas uh, better ways to do things? I, mean, I think it is a good question in terms of 
even those of us who are abolitionists recognise that the pains of prison need to be mitigated as we move forward. So I think it's an, an important space. I think there's a real, you know, and I, I alluded to it very briefly around that need to cede power. We need to cede power to those that have better knowledge. We need to cede power to the communities to do work. We need to cede power particularly to the iwi. Um, and we are starting to see that with Ngāti Kahanunu, for example. It is that form of social myopia, I think, that what we've seen is that in many parts of the world, this increasing incarceration um, and the normalising it, who would have thought that we'd be building another prison? Who would have thought that we have three prisons for women, but we've now opened a, a unit in Rumataka that also has uh, women within it? Arahata was looking to be closed down, they're building now. It, it talks to me of our, the poverty of our imagination, that we can't imagine working with this, particularly when you see that so many people are young, pe young people um, who have lived lives under conditions of scarcity and deprivation. So yes, there's, I mean, Scandinavian examples. Finland, I think, is a very good example because it had a high incarceration rate. Uh, it has a population very similar to ours, and really it just made a decision that it wasn't going to do that and uh, put the things in place to create really significant change. Any other questions? I'll go, yep, I'll go with you and then with you. Thank you. Could you mention maybe uh, a little bit more about your experience working with women, some of the things you've seen happening? I mean, it, it's been, certainly it's one of the most major, most satisfying elements of my work and certainly the most privileged. So one of the things that I recognise, and this is where the education element becomes so important, so one of the things is that every woman that I have met, and when I say woman, they were very young women, uh, when they come in, girls really, um, every single one of them excluded from the compulsory education system by the age of 13. No exceptions to that. No exceptions. So we can absolutely see that, the, the, that this is a very key area. That the fact in, in, in nearly a decade I haven't seen an exception to that. The youngest person that I've seen excluded was six. But what I've also seen is, you know, I always sort of think that I bring, what I bring to the prison is sort of school into the prison, so I sort of bring the two things they didn't like together. Um, and, and it's just the astonishing amount, the, the work, the quality of the work. I mean, this one is still in draft. She did this one in draft because she wanted, wanted it to um, be used for another occasion. So she'll still work this one and work through. She's got others. Just astonishing. You know, when I first met this, this young woman, she really struggled, mainly because of the types of trauma that she was feeling, to actually write any sentence. I did her levels, um, levels one, two, and levels one and two. Uh, I did with her uh, when she first came in. She now is just so unbelievably prolific. And for me, it's an indictment in our society that I'm seeing people flourish in terms of their educational aspirations behind the wire. You know, the waste of potential, devastating for communities, devastating for the nation. These astonishing young people. So that's many of the things that I've seen. Um, I've got others, I mean, certainly the issue around trauma is a very significant one, and it's probably more marked in the women's prison, but it's certainly a feature of the men's prison as well. Sorry, I think you'll be our last. Well, I think that's a really interesting argument, and my argument doesn't actually change. So the, the, what, the, yours is what we call the dangerous few argument, and so it's a very, uh, you know, it's a very well-known argument. It's a very significant argument. I think that we all could, uh, we could, we could say. Usually, people say that between four percent and ten percent, ten percent probably on the very high side of those people who put r people at real risk when they're outside. I certainly don't say about keeping them in prison. I think that we have to find other ways. I, I do agree that there are so certain people that will either be of harm to themselves or harm to others. I don't think that we put them in a prison. But the big thing if we do this is that many of the things that you're talking about, I believe, wouldn't happen. A real true level of, of, of reinvestment. That's why you have to have the generational gaze. That's why I've got to have confidence that my grandchildren's grandchildren will see difference. But for me, uh, working with, um, and I do, I work with men outside, and certainly have worked with many men who have been in there for sexual violence, for rape, we won't change the problem if we only work with the women. And I think that an empathetic human, it's human work. 
It's hard work, it's often messy work, but it's human work. But what we do know is that prisons create conditions, you know, the, the types of violence that we see within prisons, the other types of things, they're not places of rehabilitation. In New Zealand, 99.9% .9 of all people will be released. Does that make our community safer if you've been through that system? So no, that, that, that's one of our trickiest things, you know, as a, as a woman, as feminist, about those issues. We have to work through these issues. We can't have just all the serious offenders out and keep it there. I don't think we create the changes. We, that's where we can't let our imagination fail us. You have to be courageous, and it is difficult. I do recognise that. Uh, oh, I can take one more if there's... Oh, no, let's go for the clapping. <laughs> Kia ora koutou katoa, nā mihi. Wow, thank you, Tracy. That was uh, that was amazing. Thank you. Um, if you've got tickets to the next talk, feel free to get a glass, um, get a glass of beer, have a refresh, go to the bathroom. Um, and we've got Peter O'Connor up next. Um, if you've got tickets, sign in again with Kathy, um, my assistant there. Um, yeah. So the next talk starts at 8 p.m. Thanks a lot for coming, and thank you, Tracy, once more. <laughs>